Hello, my friends. I am here again for another episode of Get Reporting With Me, Get Reporting With Dr. Matthew Leonardi. We're going to delve into episode three, and we're going to talk about fibroids. That's going to be a big focus of the case today. Hope that you've been enjoying the episode so far. Please let me know if you have any questions, if you have any particular pathologies that you want to focus on, and, uh, and I'd be happy to do that in future episodes. Let's get into it. We're starting this case with a transabdominal view of the uterus. Remember, in my practice, I don't get patients to fill their bladder. I don't get them to fill their bladder because it's painful. It doesn't really contribute that much to the enhancement of the pictures if you're going to be taking transvaginal pictures as well. We can see here we have a, an antiverted uterus. There's our bladder to right of screen, abdominal wall layers right there and there. Here's our uterus. As per our sonographer, check it out. Sagittal, right at Nexa. Maybe they're showing the ovary there. Maybe, maybe. Starting to get a sense that this is a bit of a bigger uterus, but we don't have any metrics yet. We haven't measured. This is in transverse. There's also some shadowing here. So maybe we have to keep in mind sources of shadowing, things that prevent sound from traveling through. Back to that right ovary, caught the attention of the sonographer. Here we have a sweep through the left adnexa. We're catching the bladder here. Nothing is jumping out at me, but it's transabdominal views, so not particularly useful. Still nothing, I'm skipping through. Huzzah, we've made it to the transvaginal views. So we have our sagittal sweep start to starting off straight away. Sagittal right to left sweep. Let's pause and let sweep. So as we go a bit slowly through this, seeing a shadow, seeing, I think, some fibroids, maybe two fibroids so far. I'll pause the clip. So first, so as I'm sweeping right, we have this white dot here, which looks to be within the cavity thinking that there is an IUD present here. Of course, some of these things you may know in advance before scans because you talk to the patients, they fill out intake forms, there's information on the requisitions. But uh, in this case, I can tell already that this is likely an IUD. And as I scan a little bit more centrally, I get this structure right here, which kind of looks very close in proximity to that um, hyperchoic spot and the acoustic shadow. So I'm thinking, could this be an intracavitary fibroid? And then as I scan a little bit more to the left, I see the endometrium here and here, and they are splaying apart, which gives me even more of a clue that this is very likely a sub this is very likely a submucosal fibroid. As I scan more to the left, we get this other fibroid shape right here. And this one's a bit more challenging to tell whether it's in the cavity or not, but in this particular view right here, if I zoom this up, you see this line extends here and then it kind of darts in that direction. So this one is a little bit less convincing uh, intracavitary. It's possible that that line goes there and then it comes here, meaning the endometrium is displaced posteriorly by uh, a fibroid that's in the anterior myometrium. Hard to tell, hard to tell. Uh, hopefully we'll get some better pictures and views coming up, but this one already to me in sagittal looks like it's intracavitary primarily. Here we have a transverse sweep, which is gonna be very valuable. There's the bladder coming into view at the end, transverse sweep here, and we will stop and we will scan through it slowly. Scanning through the cervix, we have the parametrial vessels on both sides here, pelvic vessels, and here's that IUD body. So we didn't see it great, super great in, uh, in Sag, 
but follow this line up first. In the first sweep, we'll follow that up. So following it, following it, still here, kind of going behind the structure right there. There's the right arm right behind that fibroid. And there's the left arm. So the IUD is very symmetric in the sweep. The body is midline. The arms are on right and on left. They look to be quite nicely open. I think this IUD is going to be correctly positioned. Uh, and so in this sweep, we'll come back down and we'll try and identify that uh, other intracavitary fibroid first. So there's that one. And then there's that one. Let's come back to the sad sweep for a second, trying to understand this, because there's a, a lower one, which is this one. This one's more inferior within the cavity. And then this one is more superior in the cavity towards the fundus. Okay, so the first one is right-sided, because we know that this is a sweep right to left. So that one's right, so the lower one should be right. And the upper one, the superior one, should be left. Now let's go back into trans and we'll sweep up. All right, so there's that right sided one, right intracavitary one. Looks a little bit less intracavitary now, um, potentially going to be type one or type two, FIGO type one or type two. Uh, and then this one is here on the left side. Not as clearly delineated. This one has very clear borders, which may guess, give us a little bit of a clue that it could be entirely intracavitary at type zero, as we might be seeing that bright white line around it as an endometrium. This one here doesn't have as clear borders. It's a bit more hypoechoic, a bit blurred, and actually a bit more shadowing as well. Let's keep going through the series. Okay, so we're getting some measurements now. So our length here is 85, pretty typical. Actually, in this view here, I'll point out one of the really nice views that you can get to understand that your you, your IUD is central, is a uh, what I call um, a curtain, an acoustic curtain, acoustic shadow curtain here. Uh, so you have the top of the IUD, the bottom of the IUD, and the um, IUD is uh, casting this acoustic, acoustic shadow curtain in a sagittal view in a very uh, um, parallel manner as the uterus. So very likely the body is straight, meaning the arms are going to be straight. So this is a really nice uh, depiction here of that acoustic shadow from the IUD. Here's our anterior posterior, 52, typical. And then we have an endometrium measurement. I always find measuring the endometrium with an IUD very challenging because the endometrium is actually on either side of the IUD. And in this case, my sonographer has done a great job by identifying a uh, bilaminar endometrium measurement. So the anterior and the posterior, we zoom that up. We can see this a bit more clearly. Calipers one and two and calipers three and four. This gives us an overall endometrial thickness of 2.8, which is what we would expect with an IUD, particularly the progestin IUDs, which that's what this is. And, uh, and so we'd expect a nice thin endometrium. But as we were scanning through the this one, the transverse, one of the places I actually would have considered measuring this, maybe a bit more accurately in my opinion, is down in this region here. Partly because you have a little bit more splaying happening. You have a bit of fluid within the cavity. And that might give you a bit of a more accurate sense of that endometrium. So I'd go from about there to there and about there to there. Does it make a difference? We have a 2.2 uh, uh, here versus I think it was, um, what was it? 2.8 doesn't make a difference. Not clinically relevant, but maybe is that a little bit more accurate? quite possibly. However, the other thing we have to consider is that the endometrium is a large surface area space, and it's possible that there could be focal endometrial thickening in one area versus another. That could be due to something such as a polypoid, uh, or rather a sessile polyp. Uh, polypoid endometrium is not quite an abnormal endometrium. It's just what it looks like on ultrasound or at surgery. A sessile polyp is an abnormality. So, one other thing that sometimes people do is they measure the endometrial thickness 
including the fibroid. So they might measure here to here, saying that the endometrial thickness is 11.2 millimeters. This is a bit um, incorrect in my opinion, in that you're not really measuring endometrium. If you know that there is an intracavitary pathology, that is not really endometrial uh, endometrium to be measured at that same time. So I would try as best as possible to distinctly measure the endometrium from the intracavitary pathology and characterize that on your report. Coming back forward to that uh, endometrial measurement. So we got the IUD body, there's that shadow again, great. Next image is finally, we have our width of our uterus, which gives us a volume of 142, maybe a tiny bit above average, but within normal limits, pretty normal sized uterus. We're also uh, now starting the fibroid mapping. So our uh, sonographer has started here with a, a right posterior cervix fibroid. Here's our endocervical canal, slightly uh, oblique here and in transverse here, We're starting to see some vessels. Uh, they've described this as a type four because it is within the uh, myometrium, though it's within the cervix. So that terminology might be a little bit less true in terms of the localization. Uh, we might actually characterize this as a FIGO type eight in that it is in the cervix, even though it's completely contained within the cervix and the terminology FIGO type four might be thought of as uh, equivalent. Um, I think it's probably more appropriate to describe it as a right FIGO eight posterior cervix fibroid. Now it's tiny, it's 13 millimeters by 11 by 11. This has zero clinical relevance to this patient. It's still important to document, but it's also important for us to understand its relevance or irrelevance. And when I'm reporting as a gyne sonologist, I will indicate that this has no relevance. I do not want people to uh, be concerned about something that is of no concern. I do not want somebody to have a referral to a gynecologist to discuss this cervical fibroid, which is a kind of a scary term for a lot of gynecologists. It shouldn't be a scary thing in this case because the size is teeny tiny. So the next one here, ah, look at this. So the sonographers got a question mark because they were experiencing the same uncertainty that I was experiencing as I was pursuing those uh, evaluations earlier on with you. This is the lower fibroid of the two. It's the right-sided fibroid. It's the one that I thought looked more intracavitary, potentially even a type zero fibroid because of that uh, cine loop uh, depiction of the strong hyperechoic border around it. Uh, they're measuring this as 13 by 11 by 12. And I wouldn't say this particular picture is the greatest picture for us to determine that FIGO characterization. The cine loops actually are much better for that because you can appreciate a lot more uh, versus a single image. So let's see, did they take a loop through it? They did. They also put vascularity on, which is great. So we are in transverse, which we know. And so as we scan through this, does this give us any more information? Certainly it's giving us pretty typical fibroid uh, vascularity patterns mostly circumferential. I'm not getting any more of a sense here as to whether I think this is a type zero versus a type one fibroid. Similarly, I think this is the other fibroid, left-sided, although in some ways this looks a lot like what we were seeing earlier. So have they mislabeled that sidedness and that sidedness? In transverse, this looks to me like the original one that we were seeing low down, that one there. And trans and Sag, that one there. So I think that one there is the first one they're measuring, and that one is the second, because that one is the left sided one, the more left sided one. So let's go back down to where we were, right and left. So this one's not that big either, 17 by 12 by 14, but if they have an intracavitary aspect, that's actually a decent size for a fibroid. If it's an entirely FIGO type 4 fibroid, entirely sub, uh, sorry, entirely intramural, then not really that relevant, um, but in the, in the cavity, definitely relevant. 
All right. And then have we got another fiber here that did I not see? So let's evaluate that. So they have another fiber here. They're calling this one a Figo type three anterior left. And I definitely agree with this picture that this looks like another fibroid. Now I need to go back to my sweeps because what have I missed? So I'm gonna zoom it up. So remember we're going right to left. Okay, so we started off right. So there's that fibroid first in view. And then I'm mostly getting a fibroid here. Yeah, this one is a bit uh, puzzling to me. Unless they see this as distinct from this. It's possible, but those both look like if they were two, both intracavitary. So coming to transverse, keeping that zoom up. Don't need that. Mm -hmm. So we're low, low, IUD is pushed to the left of the cavity, that fibroids to the right of the cavity. I see that almost entirely as one. And then we see this fibroid here. So there's a lot of shadowing here. Maybe what they're finding in their uh, still images is they have a little bit more clearness in some of these fibroids. It would have been nice, in my opinion, to have individual cine loops of each of these fibroids to see the relative difference between them. They're describing this one as a type three endometrium we can see here. It's anterior and it's left. And this one is also left. So it's possible that what we were appreciating together as one left-sided fibroid could actually be uh, two fibroids. Here we have a, uh, a 3D render, a 3D acquisition uh, and render. And uh, our output here is that uh, turned uh, 90 degrees to the left where this is the uh, left cornea and this is the right. And this here is uh, very clearly a submucosal fibroid. And I do believe that they have done that again with it straightened in the end. So we'll come back to that. Actually, let's just skip ahead for a second to see, do they show it to us? Yes, they do. Here they go. So our uh, our work in uh, 3D rendering with our sonographers is a work in progress, like all things. 3D ultrasound is not a standard of care. Uh, we do uh, introduce uh, 3D ultrasound for uh, intracavitary assessments, IUD assessments, and uh, several other things as well, uh, Mullerian anomalies being probably the most clinically relevant. And so my sonographers are working very hard to try and optimize that. And so in this uh, case here, what we're seeing is this fibroid we are seeing, I think, the left arm here. This is the left aspect of the cavity here. And that's probably the right aspect there. We might be getting a glimpse of the body of the IUD here. Overall, we're still working very hard on our rendering techniques. So it's more uh, for um, practice at this point. It's more for the introduction of this newer technology uh, rather than giving us the truth of what's happening. I still think the cine loops uh, and the still images that we capture are the fundamentals of our imaging. All right, so I think uh, in this case, uh, we'll probably go through the ovaries and the adnexa pretty quickly, since I don't think that there's any pathology, but let's just go through it again to make sure. So right adnexa, Nothing is jumping out here at my sonographer, obviously. They haven't stopped to measure anything. And then they jump to the left side. So I think probably the right ovary was hidden for a second there. Left side, ovaries just there in view. We stop that and we push play and hold that scroller bar down. There it is. There's our left ovary follicle noted right there. And that's our measurement of our left ovary. Pretty normal size, nothing dramatic about it, very normal. Looking at it with our Doppler as well, I see no abnormalities, all good. Right at Nexa, they've come back to this. They're looking for that right ovary. And where is the right ovary? There is something that they describe as the right ovary. 
So it looks to me like what they're measuring is this. Let's come back to this picture here. Bit hard to tell. I see some vessels here. I kind of get a sense probably that the ovary is here. I think these are the iliac vessels here in transverse and the ovary is sitting on it right here. Now I get a bit more of an echogenicity than they're getting here. There's no uh, Doppler flow to this. So um, very unlikely for that to be the iliac because the iliacs are gonna show up very bright. Um, so I think they probably got it correct. The first picture was not super clear. These ones are also not super clear. So I think we have uh, to describe our technical limitation here with the ovary in that uh, we don't always see things so clearly. Now, in this particular case, our indication is uh, assessment of fibroids, not query ovarian mass. We always want to assess our ovarian masses and ovaries uh, that are normal as well. But if we don't have a particular indication, then we don't have to worry as much. Uh, and there's no vascular uh, pattern to this that's abnormal. Uh, there's nothing that looks particularly cystic about it. And if we extrapolate here, our volume of this ovary is not very big, 3.4, uh, slightly bigger than the other side. Uh, but there is a little bit more of a hypo or even potentially an anechogenicity going on here. So therefore, we should be thinking maybe this is a side with a dominant follicle. This is still a premenopausal patient. And so this could be a dominant follicle, just not really clearly seen. I wonder if we go back to the transabdominal pictures for a second, whether we can see anything in that right ovary or even in the transverse sweep. Sometimes when we're looking at the uterus, we accidentally capture things that we don't intend to capture. So I don't see anything by accident in this particular sweep here. And I don't see anything in this particular sweep by accident either. Coming back to our TA pictures, there we go. Okay, so this looks very similar to what we're seeing on the TV pictures. Remember at the beginning I said, didn't see much of interest, could see that there was this structure here, which is the ovary. Um, I do think probably this is a dominant follicle here. It's not the most uh, clear depiction of that, but there's nothing concerning about what I'm seeing here. Now, if you ever do have a concern with something that you're not sure about, the key is to be honest and describe that. Inform the referring provider that you would like to scan the patient again at a later time. And because that this looks most like a dominant follicle, if we were to scan them actually in probably a week or two, it should look different. It should look like a corpus luteum. If we scan them in a month, there might not be a dominant follicle or any ovarian activity on that side. It might be on the left side in that particular cycle. So there is an ability to get that reassurance by scanning again, but I don't have any concern as I'm seeing this on TA or TV views. So I'm not going to make the patient come back for that particular ovary assessment. Now, to conclude, the, uh, the fibroid mapping here is still a little bit of a puzzle to me. In particular, these two that they're describing here on the left side, query FIGO1 fibroid and FIGO3 fibroid. As the reading physician in this case, I have to accept that there are some limitations to the final report. The fibroid mapping, in particular when they are intracavitary, and in particular when there's other things in the cavity like an IUD, can be really challenging. Depending on the uh, plan for the patient, whether they're considering a hysteroscopic fibroid removal called a myomectomy, we may want to consider a sonohistrography, which is a procedure that we infuse normal saline into the cavity to distend the cavity to be able to characterize the contents of the cavity much more clearly. I think this patient is a very, very good candidate for sonohistrography for fibroid mapping within the cavity. But for example, let's imagine that this patient's bleeding is actually really well controlled with the IUD. Does it matter that much? Probably not. Let's imagine that this patient might be considering a hysterectomy. 
because their bleeding is really bad and they don't want to have a smaller procedure that might remove these fibroids that are intercavitary but leave the ones that are within the muscle. If the patient's gonna have a hysterectomy, does a sonohysterography help anything? Not really, it doesn't. We know that there are fibroids and we know that there's a cavitary aspect to them. So maybe a hysterectomy is fine without a sonohysterography. So we have to communicate that information back to the referring provider so that they understand where we at, where we're at, and what we can and cannot say with the scan that they've had today. So to conclude, we have a patient who has fibroids and IUD that looks correctly positioned. I would recommend a sonohistrography in this case for further clarification if it is going to be clinically relevant for the patient and their clinical decisions. I hope this fibroid case has been helpful for you, and I look forward to seeing you at our next episode. Bye for now.